And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of the Chronicles of Ares. A, a game which we will probably we will probably pronounce three or four different ways throughout the course of this. Look, at least I'm honest about it. And I'm and a man who is a who is a brave and noble survivor of the hellscape of Atlanta traffic. The one and only Greg Lambert. How are you doing today, man? It's doing pretty good, and mm -hmm. yeah, it is pronounced Ares, but you can pronounce it Ares or even Eris if you want to. Um. I'll stop. I won't go. I won't go as far as pronouncing it Eris out of fear that I'm going to get a giant katana in the back. And there's my requisite video game joke of the night. Right. You know, I actually uh, was inspired a little bit by Final Fantasy two II and three for Super Nintendo. I guess they're four and six in Japan, but seven yeah. is still holds a, a soft spot in my heart. Um, I think a lot of people. I think a lot of people. Um, a lot, a lot of people, a lot of people under have forgotten how controversial the move with with seven was. And I remember seeing articles about that where people were going, "What the heck were they thinking? How can it be? Fa how can it be fantasy when there's so much that's not fantasy?" And I'm sitting here going, "Did you guys not play three? When there was steampunk out the ass." <laughs> And hell, even in the first, even in the first Final Fantasy, there, it's not a strictly medieval fantasy because you've got a goddamn airship. I don't remember seeing those in the 14th century. Final Fantasy VII is really—it's kind of like a combination of Neon Genesis Evangelion and Akira, which is—I guess—that's why I like it so much. That's a lot of nostalgia mm -hmm. for me going back in the day. I, if I had, if I had to guess, I'd say. Um, I'd, on, I'd honestly say it's an, it's a case of a lot of a lot of the visuals in in something like seven. I now obviously I can't confirm this, and given how given how a lot of um, popular media in Japan is a mishmash of um, of different influences, I'd say the biggest influence is the artwork of Mobius, which was which was a major influence on both Akira and um, Blade Runner. Right, and uh, Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind, mm -hmm. and also uh, Castle in the Sky, yeah. Laputa. Huge uh, influence uh, on RPGs, not mm -hmm. just video game. Oh yeah. Now, with that with that said, it's a bit of a tradition to go into the humble beginnings. So, walk me through your first introduction to role playing games, and what was it that made it stick for you? So, you know, I've talked a little bit about when I was a little kid playing Final Fantasy 2 on Super Nintendo. So I was completely obsessed with fantasy at a young age, playing Final Fantasy, but also reading Dragonlance, The Hobbit, The Chronicles of Narnia, and Redwall. But I never really, like, I knew what Dungeons & Dragons was, but I didn't actually start playing it until high school, which for me was, like, 1998. Mm -hmm. I got an introduction from it from my best friend, Frank, who's helping me actually work on this book. He approached me and said, hey, have you ever started, have you ever played D&D &D before? And I said, well, well, no. And he was like, well, let's go ahead and play. And he showed me how to roll a character and create a character. This was second edition Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. And after that, you know, given my obsession with fantasy and Tolkien and that whole genre, I just was completely hooked right away. Like, we played so much. Mm -hmm. um, this is going to be my this is going to be my bad joke of the night, but when you mentioned that your buddy's name was Frank, I, I immediately thought, no relation to TV's Frank, I hope. No, no <laughs> relation to TV's Frank. Look, I'm from Minnesota. I'm legally required to make at least one Mystery Science Theater joke a week. <laughs> But when it, but 
given given that, so let's see, 1998. So I'm guessing your first introduction would have been AD and D Second Edition, if I'm guessing correctly. That's right. We played AD and D Second Edition, and we played that every single day before school, during school, after school, all summer long. We played it on the on the bus. Mm-hmm. Did you mo- did you mostly do just the de- just the default assumed can- assumed half setting, which is another which is a story for another time? But well, we started out actually playing in uh, Kren, you know, the Dragonlance setting with mm-hmm. a lot of homebrew homebrew rules for that because I guess there was there may have been a source book for that for D and D Second Edition. If there was, I never owned it. I but believe, we I believe the- there was. Oh, okay. Yeah, but we loved those books so much at the time that we just kind of homebrewed our way through mm-hmm. trying to play in that setting. Do and, you do you remember some of the things that you homebrewed? Because I'm always I'm always curious how some people will hack it. Because, well, as my mentor would say, nobody plays nobody plays Uno as written. Yeah, that's true. I I specifically created an entire handbook for how to play as a draconian. I remember that Mm -hmm. because I can't remember if the fifth age had just come out and kind of twisted the mythology a little bit. And those standalone draconian books like the doom brigade came out shortly afterward, but I was like, you know what, this would be cool. So that was one of the big things we did. I actually wrote a long like rule book for how to do that. Mm -hmm. And, when now um given now given that I'm cu- I'm curious if there if there are any um with when it comes to when it comes to some of the settings that that I miss from sec from second edition a couple that always come up t- that I'm curious if you had played in those days one of them is Dark Sun probably one probably one of the most uh, one of the most um non D and D esque um <laughs> settings. In that entire run, and the other one going even further into the bonkers territory is Spelljammer. Did you ever do any of those? You know, I lived in kind of a small town in South mm-hmm. Georgia. We actually, we didn't have a game store of any kind. There was kind of like a comic book shop that had magic cards, and I was into that. And mm-hmm. they had a few D and D books and. We just never got a chance to really delve into a lot of the third-party and first-party products like a lot of people did, like Spelljammer and Dark Sun and Mm -hmm. Ravenloft. I knew about it. You know, I saw those in magazines like Inquest and Dragon Magazine, and I read a lot of articles about stuff like that. Just, you know, we never had a chance to delve into it, though. You'd probably get a kick out of... um... Out, out of uh, spell, out of spell jammer because well, you're going, you're in space. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like it's a weird like. Isn't I'm, it like a really kind of over the top and comic booky type of setting? I'd say I'd say it I'd say it has less in common with comic books, although although it might have something in common with some of the crazy ideas that Jack Kirby had. And more and more in common with the really gonzo stuff that you would see in that you would see in pulp magazines, um, or or if you prefer um, heavy metal magazine with but it's actually safe for work. <laughs> yeah, I've got I've actually got some heavy metal magazines sitting on my desk at work. My mm-hmm. boss thought they were cool. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Which I thought was funny because like. In any other environment, they would be completely contraband. I don't know. I've I've gotten no I've gotten away with playing um with playing Aurora 4X <laughs> at work, which even if you even if even the people who like strategy games, I always tell them approach with caution if you're going to play Aurora because um you're going to be looking at you're going to be looking at spreadsheets, <laughs> which is probably how I got away with it and help. Somebody managed to find a way to play the original Civilization on a Microsoft Excel sheet. So, never wow. underestimate the power of nerds with too much free time. I mean, it's not like you can install it on Windows 10 anyway. It's kind of a pain. I've tried. 
Installing old PC games on modern hardware is always going to be the Wild West. But when it came to Chronicles, was this something that was just born out of camp out of campaigns and the like that you had been doing for years, or was it a, was it a case where um, inspiration struck one day? It was both. You know, we were, as I mentioned a moment ago, we were playing in kind of our version of Kryn, Dragonlance, and it was fun. We got a lot out of that, but I just was like, I was really reading the Cimmerillion heavily at that time. Like, I, I had read it through, like, four or five times, and I was like, man, wouldn't it be kind of cool to play in, like, a setting that was like this, with, like, the deep like nomenclature and linguistics and mythology that Tolkien created. But of course, I was in high school, so obviously anything that I was going to do was going to be very silly by comparison. But that's what I did. I, you know, I got together with my buddy, and I was like, I'm going to make a setting for us for D and D that's going to be like this. And we just, I started hammering out all these different fantasy ideas and races and cultures. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to make this huge setting that the ultimate goal for me was like, I'm never going to run out of experiences that I can throw at my players. I was always the DM, like almost from day one. Mm -hmm. So you, so you have this, so you went through the same curse that I did, the forever DM. Yep, pretty much. And uh, that's where Iris came from. It was the first campaign setting that I created and, a lot of it doesn't stand the test of time. I have to tell you that much. Uh, you know, that came from the brain of like a 17-year-old guy. Um, but some mm -hmm. of it th something that my mentor said to me long ago, and this is what this is why I'm saying don't um don't th don't put too, don't put yourself down too much on it coming from the brain of a 17-year-old. The greatest innovations in the history of mankind were done by people who had no idea what they were doing. Oh <laughs> yeah, that's Definitely a ring of truth to that. Mm -hmm. um, if you want an excellent case in point of that, since I'm pretty, since if you, since if you don't have one of these on your desk, I'm going to assume that I'm going to assume that you're lying to me. Post-it notes. That was an accidental invention. All right. No, I don't have post-it notes, but I am a big Notepad fan. I've got text files all over my desktop. <laughs> um. But I, I will admit that when I looked at the cover. One of the first things that came to mind, of course, there I could definitely see the Dragonlance influence, but another big one that I ended up thinking of, and this might be a bit of an odd choice, is the old D&D &D cartoon from the 80s. You're very close, actually. So I hired, an art, I hired an artist named Roth Radke, who's actually a comic book artist. He's like an independent kind of guy. Yeah, it's definitely a comic book style that I'm seeing out of it. And I approached him because he had done a lot of D and D commissions that were pretty detailed. I kind of mm. like the style. I was like, I want our cover art to look like the movie poster for an '80s fantasy movie, like retro throwback. And I sent him a lot of different references. One of them was the uh, cinematic poster for Disney's *The Black Cauldron*, which you know was a failure of a movie back in the '80s, but it was inspired by the big D and D boom that was happening at the time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that that's, you're pretty close on that. The cover art is actually very similar to the layout for the black cauldron movie poster. Which out of curiosity, when you were sending him um, references, were any of them, the post some um, Drew Struzan posters? Oh yeah, of course. I sent him the reference for Willow. Mm -hmm. uh, that was Struzan. Uh, Star Wars was a big reference. I wanted a kind of an imposing villain that's towering over our intrepid heroes in the foreground because a lot of 80s movie posters had that like labyrinth and the dark crystal. Yeah, I can I can definitely I can definitely uh, see that. Um and I will I will admit that Given given the um given the cover given the first image that you see when you load up the Kickstarter page was was um Secret of Nim another and possibly Mouse Guard another couple of influences. 
Secret of Nim is one of my favorite movies of all time, and that is a heavy influence for me in the setting. Um, but that's across the board with almost any classic, you know, mm -hmm. fantasy movie. Some of the ones I've already mentioned, like The Dark Crystal as well, you know, Willow, anything classic, anything retro, that has a place in my heart, and that influences where I'm going with the setting book. Yeah. Now, get... But even with that, I'm, get, I'm guessing that a major, a major visual motif that you wanted to go for is a very fairy tale-like approach. That's right. You know, we want to have kind of a fairy tale influence in the artwork and the overall presentation of the handbook. But also, we do want to have kind of a, almost a second edition innocence and simplicity to the artwork. Not a lot of belt buckles and. You know, the characters don't have a generally modern look like what you would see today. Not a um a very a very battle versus good and evil, not not necessarily a shades of gray approach is what I'm, is what I'm feeling. Correct. You know, we may have a few shades of Game of Thrones in some of the deaths of our world, but for the most part, we're a classic good versus evil, dark lords, farmhands becoming heroes. That's the type of thing we are. Which I have no problem with, because personally speaking, I'm kind of I'm kind of sick of Game of Thrones, and I've been <laughs> I've been sick of I've been sick of it long before. I hate to sound like a hipster, but I was sick of Game of Thrones long before it was cool, largely because of the fact that, um, it's a case of the lady doth protest too much with it wanting to be the anti-Tolkien. I hear ya. You know, people talk about uh the cliches of some of the things that we've discussed, like the Tolkien mm -hmm. cliches, oh, you can't have a, a farm boy become a hero. That's so cliche. It's overdone. But now it's actually become kind of the anti-cliche um, because nobody does that anymore. People haven't done that for like 20, 25 years. Like the big thing mm -hmm. now is morally gray, Game of Thrones. You know, that's the, that's the thing that's popular. And... The thing, it, the thing is, we, I've whenever people bring up the whole cliche thing, and may, maybe you've had this same approach. I've always, I've always argued that go that going against a cliche because it's a cliche is setting yourself up for disaster, because all you're right. doing is is trade is um is trading one is trading one one trope for another. Now. If now, if now, um, instead, I've always argued instead of instead of trying to go the direct opposite and having the pendulum swing too far the other way, um, why not do the same thing but but tweak things just a, just a small bit, um, uh, so instead in instead instead of instead of doing say a farm boy, why not why not use the prince and the pauper as your start as your starting act, right. You know, and that's one of the earliest ideas that I had for reinvigorating the setting of Iris was this idea that we talked about of a fairy tale kind of storybook setting, maybe Knights of the Round Table, King mm -hmm. Arthur type of stuff. But what if I took a setting like that and smashed Dungeons and Dragons into it? So we've got King Arthur versus Beholders and Mindful Heirs. You know, I was like, huh, that that might be pretty interesting. How would a fairy tale fantasy world handle being thrust into the danger and the trappings of like the D and D universe? So that's kind of the influence that we're taking Iris in as well. I'd like to I'd like to take that particular concept and see and see if I can um, up the crazy just one bit. I'm gonna give you I'm gonna give you a sentence and I just want you to run with it. Um the same king art the same sort of king arthur but instead of the classical king arthur um let's see if, br throw in um king arthur in the style of and the knights of justice <laughs> 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 which um anybody who if you or anybody else listening to this gets gets that joke then can of coke to you <laughs> yeah we're not quite as Saturday morning cartoonish, but there's definitely room for that in our setting, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got we've got Secret of Nim influences in there, so yeah. 
Well, one of our adventures is going to be a little bit more tongue in cheek. We've got a little bit more humor plan for a couple of our quests. So if you want to make a kind of a cheesy Saturday morning cartoon character in Iris, hey, go for it. Look, I listen to a lot of power metal. Cheese is cheese is just part of the job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, same here. I used to uh I sit at my desk way back in the day working on D and D and I would put in Blind Guardian, Nightfall and Middle Earth. I almost mm-hmm. I listened to that I think probably a hundred times. Yeah. Um I'll do that. I've I've um I've probably I've listened I've listened to Keeper of the Seven Keys by Halloween way too many times than I care to admit. <laughs> But yeah. it's a classic. You you mentioned you mentioned in the Kickstarter page that the continent, which is barely larger than the enti- I'm guessing the enti- than the entirety of the UK, right. is not entirely a kitchen sink. In that regard, now a kitchen s- now what exactly entails a kitchen sink varies from person to person. But how do you define? A kitchen sink setting, and where does that different, and where does that um differentiate when it comes to when it comes to chronicles? Well, you're definitely right. I mean, people have a, their own subjective opinions about what constitutes a fantasy kitchen sink setting, but when I think of that, I I tend to think of Forgotten Realms right away. Um, it's basically a setting where Anything you want from fantasy can fit and be part of the war, and there's no one questions it. You can be in a city, and there could be a golem or a robot walking around with, you know, a demon, and you know, it's just kind of an over the top. Any concept you want can work. And Iris is definitely a little bit more self contained and more tightly written than that. Um, you can probably import ideas from other D and D settings or fantasy settings that you enjoy. Of course, you know, as a DM, anybody can do that. But we like to keep Iris a, a bit more thematically cohesive. So, you know, for example, there are a few omissions from our setting, uh, like Tiefling don't actually exist in the book mm-hmm. because they don't fit mythologically within the Iris lore. You know, little things like that. Although between you and me, I think people overuse tieflings as a as a race choice, anyways. They're definitely popular. So I was actually a little self conscious when I was writing out my paragraph about how they don't exist in the world. But you know, we do have other character options where if you want to play that brooding, kind of rejected by the society around you, misunderstood character, we do have that in the setting. Yeah. Although per- personally, I've um. Even though, even though tieflings have certainly become popular in fourth edition, I always prefer, or not in um, fifth edition, I always prefer the um, interpretation that they were ge- that they were given in fourth, where they're more where um they're more like a fantasy version of gypsies. Right. You know they we have that. Mm-hmm. We have the gypsies. They're actually halflings in Iris, yeah. and they travel in uh in wagon trains. They wander around the continent. Mm-hmm. Um, and given the, given the whole, given the the fact that you're shooting for larger than life encounters and the like, what would be some of the major, what would be some major changes or even some not so major changes to court, to, um, to assumed rules from vanilla D and D that someone might have to adjust to when using, um, Chronicles of Ares? Well, you know, we have variations on all of the core races in our world, plus more. Mm -hmm. But what we wanted to do to make our character creation a little bit more unique and epic is I've written in um, two powerful passive abilities for each race that can affect combat and the in-game world. But also, every single race has uh, a pretty spectacular racial feat that they can use. Uh, For example, we have a race of a culture of humans that are almost like Arthurian, you know, very ancient knights in shining armor type of culture. And from level one, if you choose that race, you start with an heirloom of antiquity, which is kind of a magical weapon that is powerful, but it loses its power the more that you use it. 
That's just one example of some of the epic feats that I've written in for our races. Mm -hmm. And the other, now when it com now um when it comes to when it comes to the uh, races um I'm cur I'm curious what's I'm curious what some of those feats and what some of those abilities we can see from the whole concept of rune powered dwarfs. Right. Yep. Uh, with those guys, they actually paint or tattoo runic symbols on their bodies that empower them in combat. Um, for example, they, they're a race that's born from the power of fire and ice, so they can um, read the mysteries of the runes. Ancient runestones and iris provide knowledge that's gifted from the gods, mm -hmm. and they can actually enchant their own attacks with fire or ice, depending on which option you choose for that character. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, nothing super overpowered. You are, we are talking about you know level one characters. We don't want to plow through challenge rating content, you know, for that level. Mm -hmm. But it's enough to give it a little bit of a flair. Yeah. Now, given that given that you're adding three new um, three new player classes, um, the witch, the dream call, and the alchemist, um, there is one question that I'm cur that I'm curious about. Before I get into before I get into that, and that is, are there any are there any um, vanilla classes that you had to write in that that um, that they might not be as compatible? Indeed, you know, and I'm that's actually a segment that I've been typing and working on today. In fact, so that's fortuitous that you asked me about that. But there are a few things in the player's handbook and then the uh, SRD which is the reference document, which we have to use for the open game license. Mm -hmm. Warlocks or sorcerers, for example, sorcerers have their draconic bloodline, which has a pretty heavy assumption about the nature of dragons in the world. You know, basically that's built on the assumption that dragons are like forgotten realms, right? They're, they're intelligent. They can mingle with intelligent races and have children and create draconic bloodlines. Well, the dragons and Iris are like Smaug from The Hobbit. You know, they're mythological. They're extremely rare and powerful. So that just doesn't, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And there are a few little war based considerations like that that I'm having to kind of twist around and make fit within the setting. Unfortunately, one race that we, or one class that I'm going to actually have to omit from Iris is the monk. Uh, mm -hmm. We just don't have any kind of lore that would explain a monastic order focusing on martial arts. But we may reintroduce that for future expansion content. I mean, I get, there's certainly the, there's certainly the possibility that some, that somebody could rework it and just, ha and just have them be a straight up martial artist because sure. Look, you look, you know how the, you know how the rules work. If you're in, if you're in a tavern, there's going to be a bar fight at least once. That's true. That's definitely true. Plenty of bar fights and iries. Plenty of bar fights and um, I've I will freely admit I've run entire I've run entire campaigns based based on based on um bar based on bare knuckle brawlers di um getting in good old pier six fights. <laughs> yep. Yeah, we have a few huge cities in our setting that are fully mapped out. Uh, plenty of dockside taverns with CD patrons and rogues hanging out in the corner that you can interact with there. Yeah. And I will, I will admit sometimes I've put, I've put in, um, I've put in pier side bar bars and the like for the sole for the sole per, for no other purpose than I just wanted to play. I just wanted to bring in a, sh a, um, shanty song into, into the uh, gaming playlist that night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a good one. Cause look, I love drinking songs. I do too. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Yeah. Um, now, when it comes to the three new classes, we'll start with the uh, witch. Now, obviously, I can assume it's a spellcasting class. I mean, that's pretty obvious. But compared sure, to other yeah. casting classes, what would it be doing that's um, different? Witch is almost a combination of a few elements from sorcerer, warlock, and druid. The witch actually is limited in their traditional spellcasting ability by the mystical law of three. So 
if you go back and read a lot of pagan and even modern kind of Wiccan mythology about witches, mm -hmm. they're limited by a few different folkloric rules. Uh, like you see the number three in a lot of different places. It's a sacred number for them. So we work that into the class, the level up abilities that you get are divisible by three. The number of spells that you can memorize, you can only get three, you know, stuff like that. So that's a minor limitation. But beyond that, we have um, the main draw of the witch is the ability to cast hexes and curses, which uh, are don't require any memorization and they're basically an unlimited type of spell that you can inflict on your opponents in the battlefield. And we've written an extensive list of those and made them kind of story-based and uh, flesh them out according to mythology as well. Mm -hmm. Now, now, when it comes to the dream, when it comes to the dream caller, is that also a casting class, or is that, or is that a bit more of a hybrid? The dream caller is going to be a summoning class, so we're talking classic Final Fantasy II again. There's that influence. Rydia, the Conjurer, mm -hmm. that's very similar to the direction that the Dreamcaller is going to take. He has a few base abilities that let you siphon power from the Dream Sphere, which is an ethereal kind of sphere where dreams collect in Iris. And afterward, after enough power has been collected, the Dreamcaller can summon creatures from dreams and nightmares to use on the battlefield. And is it a, is it a case where um where they'd have where they'd have a set of dreams and nightmares to pick from, or would they have to go out into the world and find them? All right, yeah, it's definitely not a Pokemon type of thing. Uh, we're thinking about it's not that class actually isn't completely fleshed out just yet. We have completed the Witch and the Alchemist mm -hmm. Dream Caller about halfway, but. We're thinking about creating a branching path where you can choose the aspects of the dream beast that you summon, what powers they have, whether they're healing or whether they're destructive or protective as you level up, and then assign those to your creature so that the next time you summon them, you know, it'll take on those abilities. Mm -hmm. now, I'm... Now, when it comes to when it comes to the uh, dream colors, um, dreams and nightmares, is it a case where um, dream summons would be would be supportive at would be supportive and defensive, and um, nightmares would be offensive? Yeah, definitely. Or actually, you know, if you want to go kind of an evil and good route, you know, dreams are associated with creativity and hope and mm -hmm. you know, fantasy, whereas nightmares are evil and and harmful. So you know, one of the creatures you might be able to summon from Nightmare would be, if you remember, like in Game of Thrones, the Shadow Child, mm -hmm. or you know, a Wraith or a Night Gaunt, um, a creature that would be like that, very frightening. Mm -hmm. So there could be considerations for conditions. You know, like a nightmarish creature could inflict intimidation or fright uh, on your opponents. All right. Now, and the last is the Alchemist, and. I now obviously an alchemist class is not is nothing new to D and D or fantasy gaming as a whole, and I've seen a lot of people do more alchemist builds with the um, artificer. But how, but um, what particular spin are you taking with the alchemist in this case? The alchemist is not at all like a kind of potion brewing class like you might expect from the artificer mm -hmm. or something from Pasha's cauldron which you know i've got a copy of that i did read the um alchemist subclass that they have there our alchemist is almost leaning more towards the full metal type if you know what i mean oh i know so what you mean and now you ha now you have my attention <laughs> so our alchemist is actually a melee combatant using light weapons and versatile weapons mm -hmm. uh light armor as well they get their power from the three classical elements, sulfur, mercury, and salt. And they can enchant or basically transmute their weapons and armor to have powerful short-term abilities. Like you can cause your sword to 
bubble with acid so that the next time you attack it would deal acid-based damage or you can cause your opponent's armor to turn into solid ice so it's kind of like a combination of an enchanter and an elementalist but there's also some potion making that we've thrown in as well just to give you something to do between those abilities yeah for I will admit that when I saw the alchemist on on the thing, I figured you're either you figured it was going to be either the potion making setup, or it was going to be something akin to the Pathfinder alchemist. You know where they have where they can where they have a kind of holy trinity of potions, bombs, and mutagens. Gotcha. Um, personally, I always lean more towards the bombs because there's only one formula you need to remember: P equals plenty. <laughs> right. That and that so the, and I um I wanted to make a character that was taking too many notes from Wiley e. Coyote and just making elaborate traps. Oh, of course. Well, traps are always the kobolds mm -hmm. domain. Yeah. But yeah, the alchemist. We've got a list, a pretty extensive list of Irie specific potions. You know, mm -hmm. some of them have abilities that are similar to what you would find in the Dungeon Master's Guide. Um, but the alchemist does get the ability to brew potions that get stronger as they level up but that's not the end all be all of what they do yeah they they're mostly a kind of a mystical melee enchanter would you say would you say that they're a bit of a gish uh, what do you mean by that what was that would you say that they're a gish class uh you know i i wouldn't i'm not entirely sure about that well, putting that aside, you, now you mentioned that there are th that they utilize the three cla that they utilize the three classical elements, right? So um, they don't um, cast traditional spells. Like they're not going to have cantrips or you know level one, two, and three up to a certain level of wizard spells. Mm -hmm. um, that's out of the game. You know their enchanting abilities are strictly applying to inanimate objects only. So they can enchant weapons, armor, clothing, pieces of you know, um, basically anything that's not living. That's what they can affect with their magic. Yeah. Now, give when it comes to those when it comes to those three when it comes to those three elements. Yes. What, would each would each part of that trinity lean towards lean towards a specific style, a specific type of item, or how? What would you make if someone specialized in using salt as as the um as the element for a lot of their effects? What would what would that infer about their particular play style? Or is it a case where the where um a lot of a lot of the times el um the elements that an alchemist is use will be some combination of all three? All right, so you're definitely on the right track there. So with salt, sulfur, and mercury, mm -hmm. those are literal definitions. Like you're not actually bringing forth salt or you know using the power of salt. That's actually kind of like schools of wizardry. Mm -hmm. It's very metaphorical. So you know, school of wizardry would be like transmutation, destruction. Salt, mercury, and uh, sulfur have different things that they represent. Like sulfur is the power of fire and movement and air and transition and creativity. Mm -hmm. That's what sulfur represents. So if you're casting transmutations based on sulfur, you're usually um, pulling forth the essence of heat or flame or you know speed, quickness, uh, agility, accuracy. Whereas salt is about stability. It's about the earth and stone. So that's more protective. You're increasing your armor class. You're creating, you know, stone and ice objects. You're freezing and slowing things down. Mm -hmm. And early on, the alchemist can only choose one element that they can focus on at a time. But as you level up and become more powerful, you can combine different elements until you reach a higher level. And then you get the ultimate, uh, the prime three. You can combine all three. And we have some very powerful transmutations you can do with that. Yep. The other thing I'm curious about, give, given the way you've described it, is when it comes to the class features of the alchemist, is is that um, is that is that particular setup themed or themed around themed around eventually at the at the highest part of it being able to create the magnum opus? 
the Philosopher's Stone. Yes, that is an ability that you'll get. And obviously, I'd be I'd be guessing that's an ability that would that would make its presence known at um at twentieth. That's correct. Yep, that basically infers upon your character the ultimate um, alchemical power. You might even be able to raise your dead mom from the grave with that, but it could cost you your arm. Yep, walked into that one. <laughs> I was tr I was trying to I was trying to avoid it. Let's um, let's pr let's just pretend that I didn't make any dead dog jokes and keep and keep going. Um, yeah. Luckily, the, the alchemist can't use their abilities, their transmutations on living creatures. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, that's one limitation that they have. Yeah. Now, when it come when it com when it comes to when it comes to the um when it comes to the pantheon, um, it mentions new it mentions new gameplay elements and systems. Um, what would what would that be? What would that be implying? So one of the things we have, and, and this is an optional system, but it's so integral to the lore of Iris that we definitely encourage using it. All magic in Iris is summoned from uh, what we call ether, which is just kind of a miasma, uh, an invisible, invisible force that permeates the entire realm. Um, normally you can't see it. You can maybe feel its presence, but ether is what, and powers magic. You can almost think of it like there's been other settings that had similar concepts, almost like the force from Star Wars, not mm -hmm. quite as you know direct as that. Um, but we do have a system that I've written in the setting where any type of magic user will need to attempt to locate a source of ether. All magic users will have an ability where they can identify ether in the environment and then draw upon that so they can actually use up the ether that's surrounding their area if they're not prudent enough, and then they won't be able to cast spells anymore. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, people are always, I hear a lot of complaints about how overpowered spellcasters are. We have a few systems like that in place that dungeon masters might be able to use to offer some limitation there. Yeah. Now, when, now, um, are you get when it comes to now since you mentioned racial feats I'm assuming that there's going to be a handful of feats and possibly spells that are going to get added but are there an, are there any limitations that you're putting regarding um regarding vanilla spells and sp and spell levels No not necessarily you know we're we're sticking to the open game license pretty closely on this one so of course there's a lot of spells that we can't reference directly in the book but if you want to use wizard spells, sorcerer spells that are from the player's handbook, uh, go for it. You know, Dungeon Master can work with you to try and make anything work in the setting, I feel. Uh, at least in terms of the content from the core books. Mm -hmm. um, although, although, me, although personally, just because of my own policies, there are a few, there are a few vanilla spells that I'd, probably, um, that I'd probably omit or limit. And one of them is... Stuff like wish, um, long range teleporting, uh, right. that kind of thing. Largely because I don't like how it can take away narrative control. This is true, and Iris is very much a story based setting. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, most campaigns ended around twelfth level, from my experience anyway. I, in fact, I don't think I've ever had a, a player who's been powerful enough to cast wish or anything like that. Yeah. That's not to say. Usually, I won't get rid of the spells like that outright, but I will put some catches on them. Um, now, of course, with something like Wish, I always make that a mo a monkey's paw in some way because um, the the way I've always interpreted Wish is that you are hacking the rules of karma, and um, <laughs> right. karma is a very very vindictive mistress. is true and iris um i mentioned the concept of ether which mm -hmm. permeates the world and actually there's a world within the world called the ethereal ethereal sphere mm -hmm. um, where the gods currently dwell it's almost like the dream space but that space influences the fate of all living things if you um if you do something that's contrary to 
karma or fate, and that's, I guess it's kind of similar to the concept of of karma, then that can reflect back upon you um, later on down the road. Although when you mention when you mention that particular uh, sphere and and how it relates to fate, I will note that not too long ago I dove back into um, Kingdoms of, of Amalur, which one of the major themes with that game is every li every um, living being has some sort of fate, but be because of how you were brought back to life, you literally don't have one. To the point that if if a um, fate weaver tries to read your fate, it just comes up blank. Um, it would yeah. th would that sort of background be a possibility in the setting where there's somebody who is a literal blank within within the rules of fate? So, you know, we 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 do want to keep it a little bit mysterious. Mm -hmm. So. I wouldn't be able to dive too deeply into that, but I will say that um, one of our goddesses is Gipta, the maiden of fate. She is the one who controls the threads of fate in the etheric sphere. And we have um, our halfling race has two subcultures that are directly connected to fate and they're opposites. We have a culture of halflings um, that are wanderers that do tarot card reading. So they're masters of their own fate. Um, they, they follow fate wherever it leads them, whether it leads to fortune or disaster. Mm -hmm. um, that's, part of their, that's part of their culture. Whereas we have another type of halflings that are more like ha Highlanders, and they don't believe in that at all. They believe that fate is what they make. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like in Terminator, mm -hmm. the famous quote, and they and they exist and they have they live by a code of honor where they want to reverse bad fate whenever they can they want to reverse the misfortunes of others and be masters of fate by controlling it so you know that's one aspect of that idea that makes its way into iris mm -hmm. and <clears throat> now it, now <clears throat> sorry when it when it comes to the notion of doing pre-written scenarios, um, now obviously I'm I'm not going to ask you to spoil some of the scenarios that you have in mind, but with sure. but could you give kind of the elevator pitch with some of the um, with some of the ones that you ha that you have? Of course, the first one that I've been working on is, you know, I don't want to I don't want to reduce it to anything, but it's basically the Hobbit. I thought, well, you know, we've got a classical fantasy setting here with a lot of stuff from folklore. Why don't we have an adventure that lets players practically recreate the entire plot of The Hobbit? You're approached by a group of dwarves. They want to retake their homeland, which is being threatened by goblins or a dragon. You travel through the wilderness and encounter wilderness, you know, uh, encounters and maybe monsters that are out there in the world. So... That's one idea that we're going to take for one of our bigger scenarios is like a straight up classic, you know, through the countryside, face the dragon type of scenario. Which I can de I can definitely get that. Um, is is that the is that the main scenario that you have in mind, or is it a case where you have one lengthy scenario that you're going to have written out and a few story seeds? Every setting in the world is going to be fleshed out in our gazetteer. Uh, and what I've taken cues from, for example, the Wildemount setting book, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to completely describe everything that's on the Iris world map. So if it's, if it's got a name on the world map, whether it's a village, a town, a tower, a dungeon, it's going to be in the book. And every single one of those destinations is going to have a description of possible quests and story hooks that dungeon masters can flesh out for that area. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, we're also going to have probably around three or four of the standalone scenarios, like the Hobbit, like one I, I just mentioned. Yeah, I can, I can definitely, I can definitely um, see that. Um, and what, and now, if, now, if I'm not mistaken, you're shooting for you're shooting for around 160 pages, give or take, um, stretch goals. 
No, we exceeded. No. We've already exceeded that. <laughs> we're, we've, we're at 160 pages, and we feel like we're probably about 65 percent done. I think maybe when all is said and done, the book is going to be like 240 to 250. Now, I end up having to ask this because be, this is, this is a couple of questions I end up having to ask simply because of how much of a stickler I am for navigation. With sure. the p the first thing that I need to ask is, will you be having an index? I hadn't thought of that, but I suppose I can. I guess there's no problem with that. And the other thing is, when it comes to the PDF version, will it be bookmarked? That's going to be something I'm going to leave to my buddy Frank. He's doing all of the production for the book in Adobe InDesign. Mm -hmm. So... The PDF is definitely not going to be the same thing as the print copy. We're going to, he's going to make that more of like an ebook. Um, so it's going to have some of the uh, hyperlinks and bookmarks that you might expect from an ebook. You know, landscape art will be presented properly, things like that. Mm -hmm. And. With all with all that in mind, now first off, I do want to congratulate you on ma and managing to get past the, your initial goal of forty five hundred. Yeah, thanks. I'm really surprised at that but, actually. Now you have the end date at the end at the literal end of the month. Correct. So, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? So if you you know if you guys take a look at the Kickstarter, you'll see our reward tiers do list the ship date. Um, we plan to have the book in physical print ready to go in May of this year. Mm -hmm. um, the digital version will probably be done earlier. You know, we're actually probably a ahead of the game. We might be able to have the full book ready to go end of, Arch, uh, end of March, maybe early April. That would be pretty liberal for us. We want to make sure it's polished. We're going to have to do go back and do a lot of copy editing and proofreading. A polish is a big thing that I value. We want to make sure it's as professional as possible. But yeah, so I would I would be aiming for like a late April or May to get the book in your hands. All right, I can, I can def I'll definitely be looking forward to that. Um with the, with that set with that said I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity at play here. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me on. And um, anytime you see fit to return, whether it be whether it be for more talk about the more talk about different regions of the Aries or just a glorified shit post about why bards suck. <laughs> um, gotcha. feel well, they don't unless you're talking about you know literally, but that's a whole other story. Hey, phrasing. But, oh, but, and like, and as I always say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Gotcha. Did you have any other questions for me? Yeah, I think th I think that should do that should do it. And I'd like to give a sincere thanks to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!